Hello, in this presentation I'd like to briefly consider some of the debates surrounding the purposes of international criminal law. And here we have some images from the International Criminal Court and uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda. So some of the questions we can ask, well, the essential question we can ask here is what is international criminal law for? What is it meant to do? What is it meant to achieve? And um, we can start with a number of ideas drawn from national criminal law. So these include concepts such as deterrence, incapacitation, denunciation and education. So let's run through each of those briefly. So it's often said that the purpose of criminal law is to deter crime. If people can see it punished or if people believe they're going to be caught, then they are less likely to commit crimes. Um, now, there, is, um, there are a number of potential problems with deterrence. The first is there's not a lot of sociological evidence at the national level that uh, the, for example, severity of sentences handed out or convictions for crimes deter crimes. What appears to deter individuals is much less likely the threat of punishment but the risk of being caught. And it's that risk of being caught that appears to have a deterrent effect. So unfortunately, when we look to international criminal tribunals, it's not apparent that they're able to uh, necessarily um, gain custody of everyone they're interested in. So for example, President al-Bashir of the Sudan has been subject to an international criminal court arrest warrant for the better part of uh, a decade or longer, and he is still highly mobile, at least within um, the African Union. On the other hand, one could say, well, it may take some time, but certainly we have seen um, significant leaders and even heads of state, such as uh, President Charles Taylor, uh, prosecuted before international courts and tribunals. So um, perhaps there is, over the long arc, some deterrent effect uh, as to what major political leaders are prepared to do based on ideas of international crime. A further issue surrounding deterrence, though, is a moral one. So generally, uh, certain um, contemporary theories of justice would tend to emphasise the idea that if we are to treat people as reasoning moral agents, the point of criminal punishment is that someone's behaviour has been unacceptable and the way we communicate that as a society to them is through a criminal process. So the only good moral reason that treats people uh, on the basis of their own conduct for punishment is to send a message to them. To the extent that we use criminal punishment of one person to send a message to the broader community, that is um, on some deontological notions of justice seen as objectionable because we are not dealing with the person themselves, we are using them as a means to a wider end. Another possibility is incapacitation, the idea that if, um, simply put, that if we lock someone up who has committed a crime, they cannot commit further crimes. We should therefore be able to lower the incidence of crimes because we have incapacitated the people who commit them. Um, this has a number of problems. First, there is the idea that we are preventing future conduct. Now again, it seems morally objectionable to punish someone for something they have not yet done. That is generally not how um, theories of contemporary justice or moral desert operate. Further, in the case of international crimes, it's potentially fairly dubious. One is suggesting that if we take one person out of, say, an army that's committing war crimes, uh, who appears to be in a leadership position, then the crimes will stop. But it might be that there's a broader structure of power and someone else will simply rise to that position or fill that role and... Um, atrocities or crimes may continue. So it may risk focusing on individuals as causes of mass crimes rather than systems. Um, there's certainly the idea of uh, moral denunciation, that the purpose of criminal punishment is to say that these things are unacceptable, and that overlaps with the idea of broader education, that we are, through criminal prosecution, um, 
setting markers about the boundaries of acceptable behaviour and perhaps changing the view, for example, in international relations as to what is acceptable or not. Alright, then there are a number of concepts that are specific to international criminal law that are advanced as justifications for having international criminal law and international justice. Um, so the first of these uh, we can deal with two perhaps together, the idea of lasting peace and national reconciliation. So this is often sort of summed up in the slogan, no peace without justice. The idea being that if you don't um, prosecute and expose those who have caused international crimes, then um, this, the situation will simply continue and recur. So if, uh, and indeed, the idea that criminal prosecution may be a means of national reconciliation. Those who have harmed um, a community will be seen to be punished, and this may allow healing and for everyone in a post-conflict society to move forward. The difficulty here is the lack of evidence. So, for example, uh, in South Africa, after the fall of the apartheid regime, apartheid being now acknowledged as a form of crime against humanity, there were generally not prosecutions for the crime against humanity of apartheid. There was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in which the uh, nature of events, in which evidence about what had occurred uh, was um, unfolded for the public record. And in some contexts, actually, the relatives of victims might be more concerned with knowing what happened to their loved ones during um, atrocities or war uh, or other historical periods, rather than, um, for example, simply someone being determined to be guilty or innocent in a legal process. There's also the concept that international criminal law trials are well suited to creating an historical record. And certainly that was seen to be one of the functions of the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal at the end of the Second World War. However, this runs into some difficulties too, particularly compared to something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. International criminal justice has generally been conducted in adversarial proceedings. So where you have a defence and prosecution team arguing it out before a judge, which means each side gets to present their version of history and the court is ostensibly asked to pick between them or find the truth between them. So first, not everything that is relevant to an historical record may be presented in court proceedings. Um, and uh, second, the framing of the court proceedings from the outset might narrow the range of evidence presented. So, for example, in the Bemba trial, which concerned uh, widespread, or, sorry, which arose out of the situation in the Congo, where there were widespread forms of international crime, the trial focused only on the recruitment of child soldiers in terms of the charges brought, which meant that evidence of other crimes was not, in a legal sense, relevant to the case being run. And a court should probably reject evidence of other crimes not related to the charges. Um, finally, it's often said that the purpose of international criminal law is to provide justice for victims. Now, this can be difficult at a number of levels, um, but the first sort of question is, well, who are the victims and what do they want? And to some extent, International criminal prosecutions don't arise spontaneously to give expression to the will of victims. A prosecutor has to choose which situations will be investigated and what charges will be brought. And once you've decided what charges will be brought in a case, then some crimes will be included in the case and some crimes won't. So some victims are inevitably excluded from that process. The other possibility is we're presuming here that victims want criminal trials. They may want other things. They may prefer a truth and reconciliation process. They may simply want restitution. They may want financial compensation with which to rebuild their lives. And while the International Criminal Court does have a victim compensation mechanism, it is not particularly well financed. Also, there's the question of even if 
what victims want is a criminal process, how do they participate? You might be dealing with um, legal counsel representing a broad class of victims who are not directly present in court, who are uh, numerous and remote and potentially um, not literate in or fluent in uh, English or French or an official language of, for example, the International Criminal Court. Their effective ability to instruct counsel might be very limited, which runs the risk of justice for victims, meaning whatever the lawyers involved in the process want it to mean. Um, so there are a number of, one of the difficulties with international criminal law is there are simply so many goals that are foisted on it. So much expectation is placed upon it that it will deliver justice for victims, create an historical record, deliver lasting peace, um, deter and incapacitate, that this places an enormous burden uh, of expectation on the system of international criminal law. Also, it potentially, particularly the focus on justice for victims, means any time a defendant is acquitted before an international court or tribunal, it may be seen as a blow to these objectives. Whereas normally, as criminal lawyers, we might think, well, if defendants are acquitted, that shows the process is fair, that shows that the system is doing its job, and if prosecutors are put to a high burden of proof, then some cases will simply fail. Not and. Um, that is to be expected as part of a system of criminal justice. But it does potentially create a problem of very high expectations. This also then, as I put it, um, leads to the risk that uh, international criminal law promises too much and delivers too little. So if we look at the International Criminal Court, for example, it's been running for about 14 years. In any given year, it's had a budget between uh, 80 and 140 million euros. It has a staff of about 300. Um, it has in that time and with all those resources brought in the order of 10 cases, many of which have resulted uh, either in proceedings um, collapsing uh, or cases being dismissed. Um, it has secured five convictions, one of which has been overturned on appeal. So if we're judging the success of international criminal law, as some seem to do through the number of convictions secured, then we might ask whether the International Criminal Court is worth it, given um, the enormous resources poured in over a great deal of time, it would seem for relatively little uh, in terms of consequences. And similar questions may be asked perhaps of other international courts and tribunals. The International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, for example, has achieved a great number of things, but it does not appear to have shifted the views of ethnic groups within the former Yugoslavia as to who were the victims and who were the perpetrators in any given situation. Similarly, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda has not succeeded in prosecuting, has really not attempted to prosecute anyone connected with the current government of Rwanda, which risks it being seen as a very one-sided, perhaps, instrument. So the purposes of international criminal law are um, difficult things to grapple with and something we need to bear in mind as the course goes forward. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to seeing you in class.